I had been working on a device that looked like a cross between an underwater flying saucer and a sunken raft. The idea was to develop a small-scale base of operations that could be moored underwater. That way, a diver could stay down much longer and work far more effectively. Ultimately, it could serve as an underwater observation station, a research platform, or an automatic sentry. I had rigged the base with just about everything that might be needed to meet any kind of underwater problem. A radio receiver, transmitter, spare air tanks and regulators, a well-equipped first aid kit, food bottles, underwater flares, but I still hadn't had a chance to give it a good test. That chance was coming toward me a lot faster than I realized, with human life about to be precariously balanced on the testing scale. Sure, you're photographers. You do underwater photography for important magazines. That's right. Uh, mighty good at it, too, I might add. Well, thank you. But maybe not quite good enough for our next job. It's a big one, a very big one. We plan to photograph the Santa Colada. Santa Colada? Yeah, that is a big one. First exclusive news photos of that ship lying on the bottom would be worth a fortune. At any front page of magazine covering the world, we intend to get those pictures. But she's down at least 180 feet, and in bad water. The deepest we've ever been is 90 feet. Well, that's quite a difference, isn't it? Well, that's just why we're here, Mike. We'd like to have you put in with us. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm in the middle of something at the moment. Well, we need you right now while that ship is still hot news. I'm sorry. I'm busy right now. Well, I guess we'll just have to go it on our own then, honey. It's twice as deep as you've been diving. You'll have to do some special training in order to operate properly at that depth. Well, how about running us through a few deep dives right here for familiarization? Now we can go down our own from there. You know, Mike, these pictures could be worth about $100,000. You'd be doing us a great, great favor. I'll do you a greater favor. I'll give you some advice. Get rich some other way. The next day, I was heading out to conduct more tests on my underwater base. I didn't know if the Herveys had heeded my advice or not. They had not. They were already trying a deep dive. I saw the Hervey's boat and knew that they must be diving. I wasn't going to avoid them, but whatever kind of dive they were making, I didn't intend to get involved. The water seemed ideal for diving and for underwater photography. 
The Herveys didn't realize the great dangers in diving below 100 feet. They were enjoying themselves tremendously. They amused themselves by taking pictures and playful poses. They tried weightless acrobatics. They realized that the pressure might affect them after a while. But they didn't realize that one of the dangers can creep up on a diver before he knows it, even though it may not affect another diver at the same depth. Its first symptoms can be very pleasant. The diver has a false sense of gaiety and security and confidence. He begins to suffer delusions. Some of the delusions are playful, some of them violent. All of them are deadly dangerous, not only to the diver himself, but to anyone near him. It's called nitrogen narcosis, rapture of the deep. The rapture of the deep had hit Harry with full force in its most violent form. In his distorted mind, his wife suddenly had become a sea creature, about to attack him. He whipped out his knife to attack first. In a moment, she was fighting for her life. I figured immediately that Hervey must have been hit by a bad case of nitrogen narcosis. And if I didn't get to him quickly, he'd hurt himself and drown. I found the safety line and moved down cautiously. I wasn't able to see Hervey, but he saw me. run the knife into himself. That calmed him down. I brought him toward the surface. From that depth, we needed to make stops to decompress. Luckily, we had enough air to make them. minutes ago. She came up too fast. We've got to get her to the recompression chamber. Oh, it's too far. She'll be dead before we reached it. Hold your hand on that, huh? Hard. Get him to a hospital. Well, what about her? I'm taking her right back down. I'm gonna start recompressing her. Now, Jerry, when we get underway, you get on that radio. No, no, Mike, the radio's broke. 
pilot when you get ashore. Notify the Coast Guard, and then contact Dick Talbot at Avalon Airways. Tell him to fly a portable recompression chamber to me right away. All right, Dick, Dick Talbot. Dick Talbot. Avalon Airways. How's he going to find you down there? Your boat's too small to be. I'll take care of that. You ready? I'm ready. Jerry, hold that tight there, will you? Hold on. Hold on that tight now, you hear? Norma Hervey had come up from great depth much too fast. She had a bad case of the bends. A decompression chamber could save her life, but one might not get there for hours. Norma couldn't last that long. There was only one chance to keep her alive, take her back down to 165 feet, where the pressure would again compress the crippling bubbles of air in her body. Ordinarily, a diver stricken with bends can't do this. He doesn't have enough air to stay down the necessary hours. This was where my underwater base might prove the answer. I had enough air cylinders right there to keep Norma down for many hours if necessary. And as a depth platform, it would keep us well below 165 feet, fairly comfortably while the treatment continued. In our hurry, we hadn't even had time to strap on Norma's tank. Putting it on was painful for her. I couldn't wait for Jerry to get the boat into harbor and start help to us. His radio was dead but I had an experimental radio unit on my base which would now get a practical test. A more practical one than I wanted. The transmitter receiver, built with new techniques of miniaturization, was designed to float to the surface when released. A waterproof throat microphone and earplug were wired to the radio. Once on the surface, it could transmit a limited range. I hoped that it would be far enough. I got no answer. I had no time to wait for one. Norma's condition was getting worse. We had to communicate by means of an underwater slate. She was begging for a sedative. I had one in my kit, but I didn't dare give it to her. If she dozed off or fainted, she drowned despite anything that I could do. I had to tell her that it was too dangerous. She pleaded with me that she couldn't stand the pain. I knew how she was suffering. All I could do was order her to stick with it. She did stick with it. Her pain seemed to be easing somewhat. The return to pressure was having its effect. 
In one way, that wasn't good. The stabbing pains had helped to keep her awake. Now I could see that she was growing lethargic. My message told her she absolutely must stay awake. Her life was going to depend on it. I tried the radio again. I wasn't sure that it was working. Maybe no one was in range. Mike Nelson calling CQ, calling CQ, calling CQ. Mike Nelson calling CQ. Come in, please, anyone. Calling CQ. Calling CQ. Mike Nelson, please, please, come in, CQ. Come in, anyone who hears me, come in, CQ. Calling CQ, urgent. Urgent, calling CQ. I had to tend to Norma again. She was slipping in her fight to remain conscious. Suddenly, we were confronted with something that could provide the stimulus that I needed to keep Norma going. Sharks. Ordinarily, underwater, it is far more likely that a shark won't attack than that he will. But sharks have an uncanny ability to sense weakness. Like sea vultures, they seem to know that this girl was failing rapidly. Deliberately, I let them come closer. I was hoping that when Norma saw them, the adrenaline of fear and alarm would jolt her wide awake again. I let them come as close as I dared. My supplies included a shark repellent attached to spears. It was a new type with the scent of porpoise. Sharks fear the porpoise, which often batters them to death. But no repellent works for sure. Pallet spread, and the sharks turned away. I realized that unless Dick was already on his way in the amphibian with the decompression chamber, he'd never get to us in time. I had to find out. I decided to try and get him on the radio. Avalon 327. This is Mike Nelson calling Avalon 327. Avalon 327 calling Mike Nelson. I read you, Mike. Very weak, but I read you. Do you see the boat, Dick? No, nothing. Nothing below. It's a very small one. Can you hold in on my signal? Can you take a fix? Let's try. Give me a long count. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Ten, nine, eight. I'm reading you now, Mike. Keep counting. We'll go. Ten. Nine. Three, two, one. I'm losing you, Mike. I'm losing you. Three, two, seven, calling Mike Nelson. Come in, Mike. I had lost contact with Dick. And now, Norma seemed to be giving up. Come in, Mike. Come in. 327 calling Mike Nelson. Come in.
had to keep her active somehow. Among my stores, I had supplies of liquid food and plastic bottles. I showed Norma how to take them. seemed to have some effect. Avalon 327. Avalon 327. Dick, acknowledge. Come in, Dick. Avalon 327 to Mike Nelson. Mike, I'm reading you. Give me a long count. Do you see the boat yet? Do you see boat? Do you see the boat? I'm losing you, Mike. I'm losing you again. Avalon 327. Avalon 327. Dick, do you read me? Dick, do you read me? Avalon 327. If there was any hope left at all, it would be on the surface. I had been conserving my smoke flare until I could be sure that Dick was close overhead. But now I would have to use it. I ignited it and sent it up. The smoke would be our last resort. I started to crank the platform toward the surface. We moved slowly upwards. Norma had reached her absolute limit. If we stayed down any longer, she would die anyway. Broke the surface, there was the amphibian. Come on, come back. Back. Come back. That's right. Half a minute, Norma was inside the portable recompression chamber and on her way. The underwater base of operations had met its first real test. No matter how it might be tested in the future, none would ever be more satisfactory. Hi, I'm Lloyd Bridges, inviting you to join us for another action-packed story of underwater adventure one week from today.